Organometallic chemistry plays a very important role in asymmetric catalysis and in asymmetric synthesis. You look at the two chiral molecules which we see on the screen, you will realize that the two molecules are different only in the sense of rotation around the carbon where the OH group is present. And in every other way, they are equivalent and so they will have similar properties. Almost all chemical properties and physical properties will be the same, except when these molecules interact with other chiral species. So, when you want to synthesize these molecules in a pure form, either R2-butanol or independently S2-butanol, you need some special techniques and that is the topic of our lecture today. We <coughs> have a brief outline here. First, we will talk about the need for making chiral molecules and the possible routes by which we can make these chiral molecules before we talk about asymmetric catalysis and organometallic chemistry. Following this, we will discuss the chiral ligand design which probably plays a very important role and then we will talk about main group asymmetric catalysis where the metal atom that is playing an important role is not a transition metal, but one of the main group elements. So, let us proceed now and talk about the need for making chiral molecules. If you look at the biological activity of molecules, especially those which contain an asymmetric carbon, you soon find that in many cases, these molecules have different properties, biological properties when it uh, comes to their reaction with the body. So, here are two molecules, naproxen, which is an R isomer and an S isomer. The S isomer is a drug for arthritis, whereas the R isomer, unfortunately, is a liver poison it carries out liver poisoning. And this is a serious issue because if you give the mixture of these two chiral molecules to the patient, the patient will have relief from arthritis, but might die from liver poisoning. So, this is not an isolated incident. You can look at the listing here, where nearly four molecules are listed. All of them have got very different reactions with the body. When the chirality is changed, you go from a beneficial reaction to an extremely uh, wrong reaction or a reaction which is adverse to the body. So, it is important that we make chiral molecules enantio pure drugs, so that the patient does not suffer and the relief is really significant. Not only pharmaceuticals and uh, therapeutics, you also need to have chiral molecules to make ligands which are chiral, which we will just see presently the importance of making chiral ligands and chiral resolving agents. If you are not able to make a molecule in a chiral form, then you need to be in a position to separate the two isomers, so that the pure form of the drug can be used as a drug. So, it is important to have these chiral auxiliaries and dissolving agents. We will talk about them uh, in a minute. So, this whole area of making chiral molecules turns out to be an extremely important one. And this lecture is at best a preview. We are not going to be able to cover all the topics. So, we will just give you a peek into the important subject that we have before us today. So, let us go to the possible routes for making chiral molecules. The first one of course, is a trivial one. We can make the molecule as a racemic mixture and then separate or remove the unwanted isomer. Unfortunately, when we do this, the yield automatically drops to 50 percent, because the racemic form both the two the two isomers, the two chiral forms are in equal proportions. 
and because we will have synthetic uh, we will have losses in the synthetic step and also in the purification step you will end up with a yield which is much less than 50%. So this turns out to be an extremely uh, undesirable route but nevertheless significant advances have been made in separation technology special mention must be made about the simulated moving bed or counter current separation of molecules on a chromatograph. So, this type of a batch separation or a counter current separation allows for the pure form of each isomer even if you make the chiral form in an impure state you would be able to purify it very well using these special techniques. So, chirality by separation it not only gives you a uh, wastage uh, of the uh, compound, <coughs> you, uh, you do not get, uh, you have to spend more time in order to get the pure form. So, one way is to convert the unwanted isomer. So, you can think of uh, a situation when you convert the unwanted isomer. So, suppose you want the R isomer, you take the S isomer and convert it into the R isomer. So, this type of a conversion will allow you to separate the two isomers again and if you want to prepare more than 96 percent of the one, uh, the enantiomer that you want, you need to get, you need to carry out almost five steps. So, although this is difficult, sometimes it is useful. If you just cannot make the chiral form of the molecule, you try and convert the unwanted form of the molecule to the right form. But obviously, the best way to do it is to introduce chirality in the synthesis and very often the answer to this question turns out to be this. Uh, logically unacceptable answer. It is a circular form of reasoning. You say how do you introduce chirality in the molecule that you want to synthesize? The answer is you start with a chirally, uh, chiral molecule which is available already. So, in a sense this is a circular reasoning. You have to have a chiral molecule in order to make a chiral molecule. And so, the billion dollar question is how did chirality come into nature, into universe and the answer that is sometimes received in textbooks is that it is a cosmic accident. So, we leave it here because it is more of a philosophical question. So, let us proceed to the synthesis of these chiral molecules. One way in which you can make a chiral molecule is to use something like a chiral auxiliary. By auxiliary, we mean that it is a molecule or an attachment to a molecule which you can remove from the final product and reuse. So, here is an example. We have a molecule where we which is prochiral. This is the prochiral molecule. This is a prochiral center and you want to transform it to the chiral center which is mentioned here. So, you want to do a substitution and typically you could do this by removing this proton with a base and if you remove that with uh, a base and treat it with an electrophile like R x. So, you have a B minus and then a second reaction with an R x, you will end up with the correct molecule. Now, let us say we do it with a chiral aryl ether which has got a chiral substituent here, but you only want the phenol. Then you could still do the reaction with this species because you have one chiral center. This chiral center will induce now chirality in the position adjacent to it and so you will get very good diastereomeric excesses in this reaction. So, one of them is a wanted isomer and you can just hydrolyze or remove this ether or phenol aryl ether, hydrolyze the aryl ether and generate the right product that you want. So, this is something that you can reuse the 
chiral alcohol that you used to generate the uh, chiral form can be reused. So, in a sense chiral auxiliaries are very useful ways by which we can generate chiral molecules because they can be recycled. Now, chiral reagents are not necessarily a great idea because they cannot be used again and again. And here is the same example. We want to use a base to remove the proton and an R x to do the alkylation. Either the R x that is coming in can be chiral, in which case you can in fact generate the chiral center. The diastereomeric molecule is formed because the molecule is now chiral in two places. Here is a chiral center and here is the other chiral center. And so, the molecule can be isolated in uh, enantiomerically pure form and you could then uh, go ahead with the transformations that you want. In principle, either the base or the alkylating agent could be chiral, but notice that the R group that you add on, if it has to be stuck with the molecule, you need to worry about the final state of the molecule, whether you want the R group there or not in the chiral form. Unfortunately, the anion that is generated can racemize easily because it can do an inversion umbrella inversion and become a chiral. So, this is not an extremely good example, but nevertheless the two examples that I have chosen in the previous slide and in this slide go together. They illustrate how chiral reagents and chiral auxiliaries could be used. And let us now proceed to the main topic for today's discussion, which is uh, organic synthesis of chiral molecules using organometallic chemistry. That is, you can make a organometallic catalyst, which is chiral at the metal or at the ligand and so induce chirality in the reaction that you want to carry out. So, how does a chiral catalyst work? Now, since chirality will, uh, if you have chirality in the molecule, in one of the molecules that you are using in the course of the reaction, it can indirectly induce chirality in the reaction that you are carrying out, provided there is a prochiral center. So, one has to have a prochiral substrate and either a chiral catalyst or a chiral reagent. We have already discussed the chiral reagent. So, let us use a chiral catalyst. A combination of these two species will give us an intermediate, which is a diastereomeric intermediate. So, this diastereomeric intermediate or rather we will get two diastereomeric intermediates and these two diastereomers will be in unequal proportions because unlike enantiomers, they will not have the same thermodynamic properties. So, they might be soluble to different extents, they might be formed in different extents and let us label them D 1 and D 2. So, two diastereomeric uh, forms of the molecule of the intermediate are formed and one of them will give you the R isomer and the other will give you the S isomer. So, if the two forms are formed in unequal amounts, whichever is formed in greater amount will give you the right enantiomer that you are seeking. So, the chiral product can be generated in reasonably good yield in a pure form if you can generate the right diastereomer. So, it is important then to figure out which chiral catalyst would give you the right diastereomer so that you can get the product that you want. Now, let us proceed with a look at the catalytic site. The catalytic site has for the sake of uh, representation, you have given here a schematic representation of the catalytic site. It is usually at the metal that the chemistry is happening. 
So, the site of chemistry or the place where the reaction is happening is the metal and if your ligand is at a position which is far removed from the place where the reaction is happening, it is unlikely that this chirality would be transferred. On the other hand, if you have the region of chirality very close to the reaction center, it is likely that you will transfer more chirality. This is a very simple uh, naive understanding of the whole process, but it tells you the importance of designing the best catalyst and the best metal complex. So, it would be ideal if this metal center itself is chiral. And so, here are a few metal centers which can be chiral. Let us leave out the D 4 H the square planar geometry because that is very difficult to get in a chiral form. Both tetrahedral centers metal centers and octahedral metal complexes both of them can be made in a chiral form. And so, if you have a metal complex in a tetrahedral geometry or in an octahedral complex then both of them can be made in a chiral form. But there are not many complexes which are inert and which are suitable for carrying out asymmetric catalysis using these molecules using these catalysts. So, typically you have either a chromium carbonyl molecule which uh, is sufficiently labile and it will lose the uh, chirality around the chromium. Unfortunately, if you have high oxidation state species they are indeed inert. So, you can have inert coordination compounds, but many of them do not support organometallic chemistry because they do not support ligands like alkenes and carbon monoxide and so on. So, we normally do not encounter these systems in organometallic chemistry. Nickel 0 for example, is a tetrahedral complex. So, one would expect that these molecules could be made chiral at the metal. So, in principle it is possible to generate nickel with four different ligands and this should indeed be a chiral molecule. Unfortunately, these molecules are also sufficiently labile and so they will lose their chirality after a dissociation and a recombination. The palladium complexes which we encounter in catalysis so often are so labile that in fact many of them do not form the 18 electron complex and tend to form either the 3 coordinate or the 2 coordinate complexes that I have pictured here. So, making chiral metal complexes turns out to be a daunting task. There are a few tetrahedral pseudo tetrahedral complexes which are piano stool complexes where the metal has 3 ligands which form the legs of the piano stool and a metallocene or a arene or a cyclopentadiene which forms the stool part of the molecule. And these molecules can indeed be can indeed be chiral and they can be coordinatively saturated if you have the right electron count. And for this in the case of iron 2 plus you need 2 anionic ligands and in the case of manganese a single anionic ligand and you will form these type of molecules which are useful for catalysis. So, there are a few examples where these molecules are indeed chiral at the metal, but the examples are few again because in some instances they can lose the chirality when they react by losing one of these ligands during the course of catalysis. So, mostly catalysis of organic reactions has to be done with organometallic catalysts which have chiral ligands. So, how does one go about making an organometallic compound with a chiral ligand? Here I have uh, shown for you a slide in which uh, it is indicated that the Nobel Prize for, for 2001 was in fact given to three people specifically for doing this. They carried out several catalytic asymmetric syntheses 
where they used chiral ligands very efficiently and showed that asymmetric catalysis is indeed possible with organometallic chemistry. So, all three of them have carried out studies with various molecules which have got chiral ligands and we will deal with a few of them today and we will look at some of the advancements that have been made in this field as we go along. So, here is a enamide which uh, is in fact a, a molecule which is extremely important because when the AR group that is given here, when the AR group is in fact this substituted uh, the dye all substituted aromatic ring and if you have COOH the acid form instead of the COOME that is mentioned here. If these two changes are made you are in fact looking at L dopa the molecule that is used to for treating um, for treating Parkinson's disease. So, it was very important that you get L dopa and if you want to do that then you have to do it using a chiral catalyst and it was discovered by one of these people whom I just mentioned a Nobel prize winner that it would be possible to carry out asymmetric catalysis using this rhodium catalyst as a hydrogenation catalyst. The catalytic cycle of this reaction is something that we have already seen and we would not look at it in detail, but suffice it to say that here is a complex where the chirality resides primarily in the phosphine. So, you have a phosphine which is chiral and this ligand is the one which readily leaves the coordination site of the molecule and generates a vacant coordination site which will lead to subsequent hydrogenation reactions. So, this reaction could be carried out with 100 percent chemical yield the hydrogenation of this molecule at extremely mild conditions and with very high enantiomeric excess. Look at the enantiomeric excess that has been achieved it is close to 99 percent which means you have a practically pure drug at the end of this hydrogenation and that too it is in the chiral form. So, how exactly does this reaction work? As I just mentioned to you this cyclooctadiene the 1 5 cyclooctadiene readily leaves the coordination sphere of the metal and you generate a vacant coordination site and a place where the ligand where the ene the alkene moiety is linked to the rhodium. Now, it turns out there are two phases for this alkene. It can either coordinate the way in which I have shown to you or it can rotate about this axis and coordinate in a slightly different fashion. Let us look at a closer representation of, of that um, in, a, in, a, in a minute. Here, uh, here I have shown for you the molecule which is coordinated to the rhodium. The same rhodium could be coordinated in a slightly different form. It could also be coordinated in such a way that the molecule has got the it is coordinated in such a way that you have the COOME on the right side and the NH COME on the left side. Instead of if this is my right side and left side these two places could be interchanged and so you could have coordination of the rhodium in this fashion. So, this type of uh, interaction would give you the diastereomeric form and then you would end up with the other isomer. So, the chiral enamide hydrogenation reaction has been used as a test case for many chiral phosphenes. People take 
a variety of chiral phosphines and carry out this reaction to see what enantiomeric excesses you uh, you achieve and that is taken as the efficiency as a mark of the efficiency of the phosphine. In this reaction you need a chelating phosphine because during the course of this reaction one arm of the phosphorus can come out and so if you have two different uh, phosphorus ligands you tend to lose enantiomeric excess. So, it turns out that the simple ligand that I have shown for you here which is called chirophos is the one which is most efficient and generates the maximum enantiomeric excess. The same reaction that I have just shown for you could be carried out with a variety of other ligands and I have pictured for you so many uh, four different ligands here and you will notice that many of them are lot more complicated or more sterically hindered than chirophos. But unfortunately, none of them are as efficient as chirophos. Chirophos has got the simple methyl substituent and the backbone and two phenyl groups and still it turns out to be the most efficient system for carrying out asymmetric hydrogenation of alpha style aminocinamic acids which is the base reaction for the generation of L dopa. So, it is not clear that you need to have very bulky substituents on these chiral ligands, but nevertheless there are there appears to be some importance to the presence of a phenyl group in the ligand. So, here are the two isomers pictured now this is let us look at the theory behind why we get different amounts of the two enantiomers. Here are the two diastereomers which, uh, which are formed in the presence of the rhodium 1 compound and as soon as you form the complex you have diastereomer 1 and diastereomer 2. These are the two diastereomers that we are talking about and these diastereomers have two vacant sites. So, depending on the energy difference of these two diastereomers, you will end up with different amounts of R and S enantiomers. So, as I told you before the energy difference between these two diastereomers if it is very large you will get only one form of the one of the enantiomers because the energy required to pass over the hill on the left hand side is more. So, you will uniquely get only the S isomer as a result of this reaction. So, this is a simple enough explanation, but in real life so the li uh, real life the situation is a little more complicated. After we form the diastereomer 1 you have to add oxidatively add hydrogen you carry out a oxidative addition of hydrogen and so you get diastereomer 3 and diastereomer 4. These two diastereomers are simply different from the first two diastereomers the fact that there are two hydrogens added on to it. The energy difference between the two diastereomers diastereomer 3 and 4 need not be the same or need not be even in the same direction as the energy differences between diastereomer 1 and 2. So, the real life situation there are two different diastereomers and I have given you an example which is a favorable situation. Suppose you have this reaction coordinate where this is your starting material and you go through the diastereomer 1 and the diastereomer 3 and you form the isomer R. Clearly going towards the right side of this reaction coordinate is favorable and going towards the left side to form the S isomer turns out to be less favorable and you will get a very good yield of R. But sometimes the situation is really different and you get a complication where diastereomer 1 is more difficult to form and diastereomer 2 is easy whereas diastereomer 4 is higher in energy than diastereomer 3. So, as a result 
you have a complicated situation and the percentage of R and S that you achieve will be different from the situation which I just described to you little earlier. So, fortunately for us there is something called a curtin hammett principle which suggests that if you have a small energy barrier for the formation of D 1 and D 2, the net difference only the, the net difference between D 3 and D 4 are important. So, it is in fact only this energy becomes important if these two energy barriers are fairly small. If these energy barriers are very small, then curtin hammett principle suggests that the energy difference between D 3 and D 4 will help us to decide between the ratios of S and R that are formed. Unfortunately, if D 1 the for energy required for passing over the two barriers are comparable, then you tend to have a very complicated situation. So, the moral of the story is as the number of intermediates involved increase, then the predictability goes down. And not only is the predictability difficult, the probability of getting both isomers increase. In other words, you might get a mixture of R and S and these are the real life situations which we encounter and as a result you end up with very difficult situations in trying to while trying to make one chiral form of the molecule. Let us take just one other example before we discuss some of the principles which are behind these chiral ligands uh, behind designing these chiral ligands. Here is an example where you do hydrosilylation and subsequent hydrolysis and so this is uh, this results in the hydrolysis uh, in the reduction of this ketone. The ketone is marked here. So, it is a methyl ketone that we are talking about and we end up with very good enantiomeric excess reasonably good 76 percent enantiomeric excess and extremely good yield when you reduce it with a silane. So, this hydrosilylation reaction is again catalyzed by the same rhodium complex. So, we can carry out this reaction by using a chiral ligand and this is the chiral ligand that we uh, need to use is again a diphosphine. It is convenient to use a diphosphine and generate the chiral form of the alcohol. Once again this reaction requires that we have a chelating ligand and several ligands have been used in addition to what I have just shown you in the previous transparency in the previous projections where you had two phosphines. I have for you two different ligands here one is called diop and it is a very popular ligand. It is derived from tartaric acid and so it is readily accessible in the chiral form. Tartaric acid is readily available in the chiral form in nature and so you can make this ligand in fairly large quantities and it is a very useful ligand to have. Here is another ligand which appears to be much simpler and this ligand has also been used and two equivalents of this ligand because there is only one phosphorus two equivalents can be used in order to induce chirality. So, let us take a look at the table of uh, ligands and the type of enantiomeric excesses that you obtain when you have a change in the substrate and when you have a change in the ligand. The reaction is the same. It is a reduction of a ketone to an alcohol and this conversion can be carried out with a variety of different silanes and depending on the silane you get different enantiomeric excesses and depending on the ligand that you use the phosphorus ligand that you use you tend to have different amounts of enantiomeric excess. Now, if you closely look at this table, the first example is in fact using the same chiral ligand. So, here is an example where the same chiral ligand has been used. 
only difference between the two reactions is that you have used a different reducing agent. The substrate is the same, a different reducing agent is used and lo and behold, you change the configuration of the product. So, in other words, depending on the reagent that you used, that you use for the reduction re reaction, you can control the product. Although you have not changed the chirality at the asymmetric catalyst center, you have changed the chirality of the product that is being formed. So, this is something which you could not have predicted and it seems to be something that is dependent on inherent to the uh, inherent to the system and so one has to study each reagent and each substrate and then decide which is the reagent that you want to use. So, here is another example, two molecules one is diop plus diop and again the same ligand. So, these two ligands are also the same and you are using the same reducing agent. The only difference between these two substrates is the fact that you have a COOR group that is present on the CO. So, you end up with a group which has got the ability to coordinate. So, COOME group is able to coordinate to the incoming reagent which is the silicon hydride and so the secondary coordination turns out to be extremely good in increasing the enantial selectivity of the product. So, you can expect increased enantial selectivity when you have secondary interactions between the ligand and your substrate, between the substrate and the reagent and so these are factors which we have to look out for. So, let us look at one other comparison which is the last two here, you used the same chiral ligand with a different sense. So, here is a plus B B BMPP ligand and a minus BMPP ligand. The same reagent is used, same reagent is used and the same substrate is used and lo and behold you expect the opposite chirality for the product and that is also achieved. So, here you get a S product and in the second case you get the R product, but notice the enantiomeric excess is not identical. So, this tells you that the diastereomeric ratios that you have are because they are not uh, identical in terms of thermodynamic properties, you cannot predict, you cannot get identical enantiomeric excesses in a reaction. So, asymmetric catalysis turns out to be an extremely challenging uh, task. One has to study each reaction carefully and we will discuss this with some new terminologies and new techniques that have come about. Let us take a look at the chiral ligand design. We have in fact shown you two reactions, one is a hydrogenation, another is a hydrosilylation. And in both instances, we used phosphorus ligands and these phosphorus ligands have been made chiral not because of the chirality at phosphorus in always, but because of the chirality in the backbone of the chain which is attached to the phosphorus atom. So, what are some principles or key features which people use when you want to design a chiral ligand? Here is a list, we will not look at examples for each one of them, but we will take a look at some of these principles which are used in order to generate good chirality induction. The first one of course, is the fact that whether it should be a chelating ligand or a non-chelating ligand. This really depends on the reaction and the catalyst. If the catalyst loses a phosphorus ligand during the course of the reaction, or during one part of the catalytic cycle, 
which is involved in asymmetric induction, then it is important that we use a chelating ligand. This we illustrated in the first reaction for the hydrogenation reaction. It is very important that you have a chelating ligand, but this because it was one of the first reactions which was studied extensively, people have tended to believe that you should always have a chelating ligand and that is not necessarily true. The ligand bite size was different in the case of chirophos and in diop and that made a difference in the amount of chirality that it induces. A second factor is a if there are two ligands and the two lig two ligands and both ligands are connected to one another, then if they are going to have a C2 symmetry, the number of intermediates would come down by half. So, having C2 symmetry in the ligand structure turns out to be a way in which you can reduce the number of intermediates and so increase chirality. Chirality only requires the absence of an S n uh, symmetry and so one can have C 2 symmetry and still have very good chirality induction. Now, comes secondary coordination which I have already hinted for you in the previous transparency in the, in the previous projection. If you have weak interactions between the ligand and the reagent or if you have between the substrate and the reagent like hydrogen bonding or electrostatic interactions or pi pi interaction as in the case of two phenyl groups on the substrate and the reagent, then it turns out that enantiomeric excesses will be higher. Enantiomeric excesses go up when you have any interaction between these three groups of moieties which are interacting. Steric crowding, although it is not a key factor, it is important when you want to increase the chirality. At least in some cases, steric crowding is as important as the secondary coordination. Lastly, we should emphasize the fact that in order to generate these chiral molecules, we need a pool of chiral molecules and these are provided by naturally occurring sugars and amino acids and peptides. So, these molecules provide a chiral pool and this has been called the chiral pool approach for asymmetric catalysis and asymmetric ligand design. As I mentioned to you, it is important to have a chiral ligand, but not always. Here is an example which has been very efficiently illustrated by Rajan Babu, who has studied these sugar coated phosphenes. Here is a allopyranoside, the two sugar moieties which are linked to each other and one of the alcohol groups has been converted into the into a phosphine moiety. So, you can either have a phosphite or a phosphinite depending on the type of groups that you have here. I will mark it with a different color in order to emphasize that. So, here is the here is the group which is chiral. This is the chiral moiety and this chiral moiety can be either a phosphite or a phosphonite and depending on the reaction, one might have to use either a phosphite or a phosphonite. The electronic requirements are different and this has been amply illustrated by Rajan Babu for ene additions. So, there are other reactions which have been studied by Reeds who also uses monodentate phosphides and has shown that these are significant enough or sufficient for carrying out chirality induction very efficiently. A major challenge comes up with asymmetric allylic activation. These are especially difficult because asymmetric activation requires that we have a uh, we have some regioselectivity. So, R and R dash are different. Whether you want to carry out the substitution in this position or in this position, 
is determined by the ligand that is there on the palladium. Palladium turns out to be an extremely useful metal and palladium phosphorus complexes turn, turn out to be very good for carrying out activation of these allylic substrates towards nucleophilic substitution reactions. And uh, one of the nucleophiles which is commonly used is the diethylmalonate substrate. And so, here is the diethylmalonate group which is uh, which comes in and whether it attacks in the position the first position or in the second position is critically determined by the ligand which is there on the palladium. And secondly, depending on how you have a chiral uh, moiety on the phosphorus, it determines whether the the molecule the final product is chiral or not. In this context, it has been important to generate what are called modular ligand systems. This is the same idea which has been called differently by different people. Some people have called it the molecular toolbox technique or editing the stereochemical elements. All of them are nice catchwords, but they are based on the simple idea that if you have a phosphonite or a phosphite, you can vary the influence of each group independently by changing the R groups. For example, in this case, in this uh, in this phosphorus ligand here, there are three different handles which are very easily changed uh, in the binol which is chiral, which is coordinated to the phosphorus. You could either change R or R dashed and you could also change in the oxazoline moiety that is attached to the phosphorus. You can change this R group. So, you have three different combinations that can be varied and you will very soon have a large pool of chiral molecules. And these large number of chiral molecules can be used as a test for testing the allylic activation reaction. Here is another possibility. I have already shown you sugars and how um, Rajan Babu has used sugars for coating phosphorus or covering the phosphorus ligands with them. And because they are chiral, they induce uh, chirality in the product. Uh, Hoveda has specialized in the use of peptide ligands. So, here is a ligand which is based on a peptide, uh, two amino acids linked together. And here are the two amino acids which are uh, which are linked together CONH group CONH group. And these two amino acids are now linked to uh, aromatic phosphine. And this now turns out to be a catalyst because it can coordinate to copper 1. And the reagent that is used for alkylation of this enone the R group attacks in this position and the final product turns out to be chiral because this is a prochiral center where you are going to add the R group. This 1 4 addition is usually carried out by a copper organometallic and this copper organometallic will have a phosphorus ligand attached to it when it carries out this nucleophilic substitution. Turns out that you can have a large number of rings that can be alkylated in these places. And Hoveda has exploited that to make a chiral naturally occurring, occurring molecule. This naturally occurring molecule is biologically active and he has made it in 97 percent enantiomeric excess by using this ligand, which is again based on a peptide which is available. So, it turns out that you can either use sugars or peptides and convert them into phosphines or phosphites and these are in turn very convenient for carrying out these type of asymmetric catalysis. Now, you might be wondering how do you decide which ligand we can use for which reaction and now there are companies. I would encourage you to take a look at this company's website which in fact has a list of reactions which are which are 
um, uh, which can be carried out using chiral ligands which are available in the literature and they suggest what ligand can be used for the particular reaction. So, here are the list of reactions, uh, the hydrogenation uh, reactions that need to be carried out and the enantiomeric excesses that can be expected from these reactions if you use the preferred catalysts. So, these catalysts have been developed by various researchers um, uh, like Rajan Babu and uh, the others that I have uh, mentioned and it is now possible to go to the literature and figure out which ligand I should check first before I start a research project on say the reduction of C n groups or for the alkylation of a enone and so on. So, uh, before we close we should mention that until now we have dealt with main group we have dealt with we have been talking about transition metal organometallic catalysis. Now, is it possible to have main group metals catalyzing reactions in an asymmetric fashion. So, asymmetric catalysis or AC can be in fact carried out with main group organometallic compounds also. Here I have for you an example where the calcium compound which is listed here. This L here is to start with it is the solvent molecule which is either THF or dimethyl ether, but it is replaced by the chiral ligand which I have for you on the on the right side of the screen. This diol which can be made in a in an easy fashion in a chiral form can be used as a ligand for this calcium compound before it catalyzes this aldol reaction very efficiently in a chiral form. So, here is a chiral center which has been generated in the aldol and that chirality is extremely high when you use these calcium uh, complex complexes with the chiral ligand. Now, it turns out that in solution it has been possible for them to show that there is a complex calcium uh, uh, calcium coordination compound in which you have the ligand associated with the calcium. Unfortunately, the ratio is not 1 is to 1. 5 calcium atoms are associated with nearly 8 of these uh, bases or the alcohols in the structure of the species which has been detected in the mass spectrometer. This is only an indication that it is possible to have calcium coordinated with these diols in solution and the and the inference that you have a chiral product suggests that somehow this chiral ligand must have played a role during the aldol condensation of these two reactants. So, although we have discussed a variety of principles here, we notice that there is a long way to go. People have developed various ligand structures. These ligand structures have got complicated geometries, but there is no simple way to predict that if you take one particular ligand, you will be able to induce the maximum chirality. Merely increasing the bulk of the ligand does not help and inducing chirality by adding hydrogen bonding groups or for that matter pi pi stacking interactions does not always give you the best chirality, but more importantly it is not a predictable change. Although there are increases in the chirality induction when you add hydrogen bonding groups or pi pi stacking interactions. So, there is a lot to study and lot to contribute in this particular area.